so what I'm really going to be talking about is using chimes, which I'll define in a minute, to include many body interactions within DFTB. And in this case, we're doing it entirely through the repulsive energy. So we're sort of assuming that the Hamiltonian and the SKF files that you've generated are just fine overall, but uh, that uh, the, the sort of other part, the, the more empirical part of DFTB needs to be tuned with some kind of many body interaction. Okay, uh, not that. So here's just a quick refresher. So there's the DFTB total energy. You can see here, so you've seen this a whole bunch now. We have two terms that we kind of loosely call, or we, we call the quantum mechanical terms. So you have your band structure energy, that's, you know, you, you get through solving the eigenvalue problem. You have the self-consistent charge part, that's the coulombic part. And then everything that's left over is this repulsive energy, which can become very empirical. So you can really tune it to your DFT reference data of choice, uh, you know, for your system of choice. The actual energy expression that's usually written down for the repulsive energy is right here. So it's, you know, sort of a, a little bit of an incomplete name because it has ion ion repulsions, but it also has other things that we've mentioned, like the Hartree double counting term and exchange correlation double counting terms. And I would say it's, it's with that exchange correlation part where there can be sometimes many body effects that are, are missing. All right, so the key points, the things that, you know, hopefully uh, you, you can remember from this talk is that, well, uh, you know, the, the thing you can remember from the tutorial, in fact, is that the Hamiltonian parts and the, the quantum mechanical parts are pre-computed. And that's really where we get this massive savings with DFTB is we don't have to compute complicated integrals. We don't have to create a, a Hartree potential, et cetera. Um, and, and that does most of the heavy lifting, lifting. And so then you can create usually a very short ranged empirical function to get the result that you actually need. And in this case, we use our chimes formalism. So I have sort of the overall take home points that I'd like you to get in the next 15 or 20 minutes. Um, so the, the main point is that Frequently, these two body interactions for the repulsive energy, treating just that empirical part as a pairwise potential does work, uh, but there are times when it doesn't. Uh, and that's because of this neglect of multi-center or many body terms. Uh, sometimes in the Hamiltonian, I mean, the Hamiltonian, the approximate Hamiltonian could have things that were missing that we want to kind of sweep into the repulsive energy. Or frequently, it's just that the repulsive energy, that, that energy expression itself does have many body interactions that we need to consider. So CHIMES, our force field method, stands for the Chebyshev Interaction Model for Efficient Simulation. And the idea here is we are once again going to do a linear least squares fitting. We have linear parameters. We're, creating, we're going to create this repulsive energy through a linear combination of Chebyshev polynomials that have a different dimension or bodiedness. Okay. And so that's, uh, you know, that's sort of the crux here is that we're going to leverage Chebyshev polynomials and that we're taking linear combinations. We can solve for our global minimum directly, like Yala was mentioning. Um, silk and polymorphs seem to become sort of this nice bell, bellwether kind of test case for creating DFTB models because it's hard and using traditional methods uh, like a, a strictly pairwise interaction for the repulsive energy just don't seem to work. Um, so we're going to take that problem and just see, at least at first glance, can we get chimes to do uh, to, to include the many body effects in an accurate way. Um, since chimes really depends heavily on Chebyshev polynomials, I thought probably an important thing to talk about today is the polynomials themselves and why they're an important interpolation tool and why they end up working for this kind of force field or repulsive energy interaction. Um, like I've said, I, I wrote here, we will discuss how to create an MD potential using uh, many body Chebyshev polynomials. Um, so that's the context that we first created CHIMES was really with pure uh, parameterized molecular dynamics calculations. Um, but you can see it translates very easily and straightforwardly to a repulsive energy. All right, so uh, Chebyshev polynomials are a convenient basis set for atomistic modeling. So um, there are a lot of convenient properties that are worth mentioning. Um, they are an orthogonal basis set. Um, you, uh, so you can approach completeness. Uh, they can be generated recursively. So you can, if you rely on them, you can have sort of a flexible functional form uh, when creating your potential. And you kind of can get the derivatives while you 
uh, are computing the regular polynomials for the energy expression themselves because there's something called Chebyshev polynomials of the second kind, which are related directly to Chebyshev polynomials of the first kind. So now let's go back up to the top up here. Okay, so what are Chebyshev polynomials? They're actually just a cosine series. They're not unrelated to like a Fourier transform. You know, that might be a little bit more familiar to people. But basically with Chebyshev polynomials, what we say is that uh, we're going to take powers of cosines and that's going to be our basis set so you could say here we you can see we have x if x equals cosine theta uh, then the chebyshev polynomial will be uh, cosine uh, you know becomes a function of x where we're taking different powers of, of the, we're taking cosine n times theta essentially and so because x is uh, equals cosine theta is naturally bounded by a range of minus one to one Okay, and that's where sort of in, with Chebyshev polynomials, that's something important to point out. Uh, they're a function of a variable that that oscillates between minus one and one. That's its range, and so we have to perform some kind of coordinate transform, which I wasn't going to go into detail here, but that is an important part of it. I think I mentioned it there. Yeah, and the one of the very nice things about Chebyshev polynomials is this recurrence relation. Okay, so you can just build up as many as you need, um, and uh, and so forth very easily just by sort of specifying what order you want, you just kind of build them up. And then down here, you'll see, uh, there we go. So here you, let's call you a Chebyshev polynomial of the second kind. Well, because the first kind is just some uh, cosine function, then we can also have a recursion relation in a set of polynomials that we'll call the second kind, which are related to the derivative of the first kind, right? So we start with cosines, you take the derivative and you get something that, uh, varies as, as a sine function instead. Okay, so uh, what are the, the, the main points here to remember? Well, Chebyshev polynomials of the first and second kind are orthogonal. Okay, so they're orthogonal polynomials. That's incredibly useful, and they can be generated recursively. So we have a sense of a complete basis set. Okay, you can just kind of keep adding more and more polynomials until you asymptotically re reach some kind of limit that you find satisfying. Um, you know, relying on them also adds this flexibility. Instead of having a fix, fixed functional form like most molecular dynamics potentials, not all, but most, you know, we can kind of change it as needed for the application. There, there's something that, you know, is also important, which is Chebyshev polynomials have something called a nearly optimal property. Okay, so this is a special property of Chebyshev polynomials that makes them particularly good for interpolation problems. And it has to do with how the error changes. And basically, the uh, error in a Chebyshev polynomial will minimize uh, in this very predictable way. So this is part of what makes them, you know, really great for, for these kinds of problems. All right. So, you know, since we're still on the subject of Chebyshev polynomials, um, this is an example of, that sort of shows how Chebyshev polynomials can be used and things like overfitting become less of a problem. So here, what we've done is we're, we're going to look at a Chebyshev, a, a polynomial expansion of something called a Runge function. So the Runge phenomenon is when you get oscillations at the edges of an interval that occur with polynomial interpretation, interpolation of high degree over a set of equidistant interpolation points. And so it's the sort of classic numerical methods uh, textbook problem. We have this Runge function. In this case, I took the Wikipedia problem. So that's f of x equals one over one plus 25 x squared. And you can see, I, I didn't actually do this calculation. I stole it online. But you can see that if someone represents that, uh, tries to interpolate using a standard power series, right? So now you have things that are a, a function of increasing powers of x, and you have equidistance interpolation points, you start getting these kind of high oscillations towards the end and it gets worse you know the more polynomials you throw in the higher order of your expansion the worse this gets now with because of this in part because of this nearly optimal property of Chebyshev polynomials and in part because of where the, the nodes are clustered sort of towards the end um, you can avoid that problem okay so here's an example now if you want to look at the dashed line that's the actual Runge function so that's the one over one plus 25 x squared uh, the blue a line is a Chebyshev expansion in the middle to the order of 12. Okay, so it's sort of a low order Chebyshev expansion. And then the X's are actually the interpolation points. Those are the nodes of the polynomial. And so at an order of 12, we're not doing so well. It's not really a great representation of the function, but it's, you know, it, it certainly isn't doing anything chaotic yet. And then I, I kind of stopped with an expansion of the Runge function up to a polynomial order of 32. 
And things just get increasingly better in this case. The more polynomials I throw at it, the more the error shrinks. Okay, so the take-home message now is higher order Chebyshev expansion, a higher order Chebyshev expansion can systematically improve the interpolation and it can mitigate this Runga phenomenon. Okay, so it's this kind of thing that motivated us, I would say, to, to consider Chebyshev polynomials. It's a sort of very useful feature here. Okay, so then I thought, well, we can look at a physically more physical problem. What if we take the, the standard Leonard Jones molecular dynamics potential? So, you know, it's a one over R to the six, one over R to the 12th varying potential. Um, and uh, can we expand that and see a similar phenomenon? Okay, so on the first, let's look at the left. So what the GIF is showing you here, we have the black line is the actual Leonard Jones potential. And then you can see in the key, it says N equals some value. That's the the Chebyshev polynomial order that I expanded to. You can see by n equals seven, so a seventh order expansion, we have at least visually what's, what is, seems to be a very faithful representation of the Leonard Jones potential. Okay, so it's good. On the right, we have the error function. And I put that in because that really very nicely illustrates the nearly optimal property. The more uh, uh, higher order polynomials I throw in there, uh, the smaller the error gets. The error is going to, uh, you know, this is sort of this last bullet point down here is sort of the statement of how it's nearly optimal. If you expand a function to polynomial, Chebyshev polynomial order up to n, well, then the error function is going to vary as polynomial order n plus one. Okay. So, uh, and then in addition, those polynomial, uh, the, the, that error function is going to oscillate roughly between a minus epsilon and positive epsilon, and epsilon will shrink as you go to higher order. And this has to do with this near, nearly optimal part and, and the fact that Chebyshev polynomials are monics. What that means is they have this very, sort of very predictable decay to the coefficients as you go to higher order. Okay, so, so hopefully you know, it makes sense now. Well, there, Chebyshev polynomials are just this incredibly easy to use and actually kind of fun to use uh, basis set. You, know, you can represent quite a bit and you can kind of be very systematic about things. Things like overfitting can be easier to deal with. It's not to say that they're the be all end all for, for two body or any kind of interpolation. There are instances where Chebyshev polynomials like any polynomial expansion are just not that great. Like if you have steep gradients, you know, or if you need an efficient representation and you have incredibly large oscillations and function, there's lots of cases you can imagine where you're, you're gonna struggle with it, but they can be very good. And so it's a nice starting point. So now we can finally move on to chimes. So what do we do with chimes? Where well, we're gonna create many body Chebyshev polynomials. And the sort of starting philosophy, the heuristic that we followed is an n-body expansion. So you say quantum mechanics, particularly DFT in our case, includes many body interactions. Okay, so you have a single atom is interacting with a, a slew of others simultaneously. So you can think of this uh, in terms of an n-body expansion. So we can say that um, actually this DFT energy that we might be interested in could be considered a sum of one-body terms two body terms, which would be the pairs and then three body terms up to some N, you know, after which we truncate things. Okay, so we can sort of start with DFT, which has all of these N body interactions in, and then uh, we can try to express each of these terms right here in terms of some kind of linear combination of Chebyshev polynomials. Okay, and I emphasize again, uh, the polynomials themselves have a range of minus one to one. So there is a coordinate transform that has to happen also. So sometimes I accidentally switch between uh, Cartesian, you know, I'll show Rij and then I'll switch to Xij. And that's what I'm doing there implicitly. Okay, so what do we actually do with chimes? Okay, so chimes again, it stands for the Chebyshev interaction model for efficient simulation. Okay, uh, and now Chebyshev polynomials will serve as a many body orthogonal basis set where we're gonna take linear combinations of the basis set to fit our potential. So we'll start with the pairwise terms. So by pairwise terms, I literally just mean, if you have a solid, you know, some periodically replicated system, you have a solid you just loop over all ij pairs within some cutoff, okay? And that pairwise interaction becomes sort of this, uh, a linear combination of two body or, you know, one dimensional Chebyshev polynomials that vary, you know, as a function of xij. Uh, we can then create a three-body polynomial by considering the fact that uh, three bodies uh, have three unique pairs. It's a choose problem. So three choose two equals three. So if we have three bodies, i, j, k, we then have three unique pairs, i, j, j, k, and i, k. And so now our polynomial becomes 
a three body polynomial here. So you have uh, one polynomial as a function of xij, another polynomial of uh, multiplied by a polynomial of uh, xjk, so an independent variable, and then one of ik. So you have three independent variables multiplied together. You now have a three body orthogonal polynomial. Okay, and then the triplet might look like this. So you have an I, rik term, rjk term, and rij term. You can keep going. In fact, in chimes, I think, you know, we, we, we uh, have the capability to keep going, but in general, we don't. We, you know, we sort of stop after four bodies because it start, you start getting very complicated polynomials. You know, the, more, the larger bodiedness you go to, the more pairs you have to consider in this representation, in this kind of pairwise decomposition that we're doing. So a four body term becomes four choose two. So six unique pairs. So now we have i, j, k, l, which means we have an i, j term, an i, k term, an i, l term, a j, k term, j, l, and k, l terms. And so a four body cluster within some kind of solid would look something like this, right? You'd have your r, i, k. I tried to use arrows to sort of show where, you know, how you, you need all of those terms to have a unique description of, of the four body interaction in this case. All right, so, so that's what we're armed with. So our four body energy is gonna look like that. We're gonna have our six element four body Chebyshev polynomial. And it's going to be, we're gonna take a linear combination of that as well. And that's how we'll create the four body interactions. So when you throw it all together, it isn't quite so neat, but it, it, it's not so bad either. Um, there's a lot of details there. So now here on the top, I have uh, the energy expression for chimes. So we have the one body term, right? two body, three body, four body. You can have coulombic interactions for like force field development from like dynamics. You know, you don't need that for DFTB. Um, so I just kind of threw it in there. So that's the two body energy. So you can see I have my two body Chebyshev polynomials. Uh, the C's over here are the co coefficients of linear combination. Then I have my three body polynomials and so forth. And then four body polynomials, et cetera. Uh, we add some cutoff, some smoothing functions to ensure uh, a, a zero derivative at the boundary at R max. Um, you don't, there, there are ways of getting around that, but in general, that's how we do things. We also have a cutoff function. Okay, so finally, what can we say about chimes? Well, you know, we're gonna utilize Chebyshev polynomials, which are orthogonal, so we can have this sort of flexible framework for things and a sense of completeness to a degree. We can have a complete basis set um, that because your basis set, your polynomials are orthogonal, uh, regularization can be very easy, meaning you can do an expansion and, you know, the, because all the, the basis functions are orthogonal, you can zero out higher order ones that you might not want. You know, you could expand up to very high order, but then when you're actually doing calculations, truncate your sum uh, and, and efficiently regularize that way. It's linear, that's probably the biggest key. So you can get many body effects with fairly rapid uh, parameterizations, but really takes a long time is generating the DFT data and figuring out what DFT data you want and so forth. Okay, so because the optimization though is rapid, you can use it as a, a many body screening tool for, uh oh, uh, you can use it as a many body screening tool for, uh, you know, SKF, Slater cost or file parameterizations and things like that. All right, so I think we're almost done with the lecture part. Um, so this is showing a sort of a typical flow chart for how we'd create a chimes potential. In this case, it was, I, this is taken from, you know, a talk where we were talking about MD potentials, but the same thing applies. Um, so you, you start over here, you generate some DFT training data. And based on that, you generate your chimes model. Let's call that FF, you know, for force field. You can then have an iterative process as needed. This works very well for molecular dynamics model development, where you then launch a, a, an MD simulation with chimes, and then you, you sort of uh, maybe make some additional validation or comparison to DFT. And then based on that, you can expand your training data and so forth. And you kind of go through this loop self-consistently until you feel like you've arrived at a reasonable answer. The kind of training data we tend to use for, for repulsive energy generation as well are things like the forces. I mean, that's, that's just sort of a trove of data, right? If you have N atoms in your system, then you have three N forces. So each MD snapshot gives you three N data points, which are incredibly useful. Um, frequently, we're interested in equation of state data. So pressure versus volume, energy versus volume, et cetera. So we tend to include the diagonal of the stress tensor. So just those that contribute to the, the actual uh, 
pressure. Um, you can include the system energies also. Um, it, you know, whether that's needed for repulsive energy is, you know, really depends. I've, you know, can go either way. Um, but that's the idea. So you can kind of generate data along these lines. Frequently, we'll use MD data, not always. So in the example today, I'll use some MD data and some non-MD data, just static data. But you, you get the forces, energy, stress tensor. You do this kind of very quick linear optimization. Um, and so you can solve for the optimal coefficients through any number of standard packages. SVD, singular value decomposition, is nice. Um, I actually find that the LARS algorithm just uh, is uh, very useful. You can regularize with LASSO. That's another common kind of machine learning tool for regularization. Okay, so um, here's our problem for the day. We're going to try to determine a many body repulsive energy for silicon polymorphs using DFTB chimes. Um, Yala, uh, and I think Yala in particular went over this, but I have some pictures here. So we're going to train to data from these polymorphs, graphene, diamond, the simple cubic, and the BCC lattice. So we have many different coordination numbers. Um, I threw in an extra, we're going to train to that, and then we're going to validate against this plus this BC8 phase, which I threw in there just because I was familiar with it. Um, so it's sort of a unique high pressure phase of silicon uh, where you have a BCC lattice, but uh, your repeating unit is sort of eight atoms instead of a single atom in this case. And so we're going to train against uh, energy versus volume data for four solid phases and some MD data. I forgot to include that there. And so our goal for just this first snapshot is to see, can we get the energetic ordering right? Can we get the nearest neighbor distances right? Uh, and how do we do for an entirely new phase, you know, so the BCA phase. 